What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Spark to Fire. I'm here today with John Barry, CEO and president of Barry Law Firm. How you doing today, John? Great, great. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming in. Uh, tell uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. You know, what was kind of the origin story of John? Sure. So, I mean, there's there's an origin story of the firm, which I suppose isn't much different than the what you would get from the Joe Ricketts book or the. Uh, Ed Stack book. I don't know if you've read that from about Dick Sporting Goods, but so we're a, a multi-generation family business. Uh, my father started the firm in 1965. He was a Vietnam veteran. He had a famous case where he defended the commander of the Fifth Special Forces, uh, Colonel Rowe, Colonel Bob Rowe, who was charged, him and some other Green Berets were charged with murder for killing a double agent in Vietnam. The CIA had given them the order to kill the agent, and then when they did their after action report and reported it, they said, you did what? And uh, criminal charges, they were detained. Uh, it was it was horrific. And my dad ended up subpoenaing Nixon when they caught a CIA agent lying on the stand. Uh, they talk about that Perry Mason moment where lawyers cross-examine witnesses. Yeah. This is where my dad cross-examined a CIA agent. They found he was lying. They subpoenaed Nixon and case was dismissed. And so he came back. <laughs> uh, he, he was practicing in New York for a while and he came back to Nebraska. Uh, he, his origin was in Ottawa, Iowa, very close to here. And he was noticing that in his trial practice where he was representing people in uh, injury cases or criminal cases, that a lot of veterans were running into issues with uh, uh, that manifested in legal problems like divorces, uh, domestic violence, DUIs. And, and, and that was not, it was not known at the time, but it, it, it came from post-traumatic stress disorder, what we now call PTSD. And he began representing a lot of these veterans on a pro bono basis, making sure that the VA was giving them the benefits that they earned. Mm -hmm. And long story short, he continued to uh, build his trial practice. Some changes in the law occurred that allowed us to represent veterans earlier in the process. And so our firm began to grow. Now, how I fit into the process was I was born uh, here in the in Lincoln in the 1970s, and uh, I had a paper out uh, when I was 10 years old. And you know, my parents were very good about giving me opportunities. I didn't hear no very much. I did not have a structured childhood. I remember the first <laughs> thing I ever really wanted was the Schwinn Predator bike. My yeah. dad said, "Well, okay, great, go earn it, go, go earn the it. money and get it." Yep. And so I said, well, how can I get money? And, well, you can you can get a paper out now. You can detassel corn in the summer. There's yeah. a lot of opportunities for young <laughs> uh, young men to get jobs. So at 10 years old, I started working for Journal Star mm -hmm. and started was delivering papers. And I, I reached a point where I said, yeah, I want to play football. And, and I couldn't just get the paper out done and then go to football practice. I had to figure it out. So then I hired my sister. And my oh. sister helped me with the paper out for a while. And then I had to fire her, hire my neighbor, <laughs> you know, to take over part of it. And then in the summers, I would have the paper out and detassel corn. And, I, you know, that, that taught me a lot about having a good work ethic. It taught me a lot about AR, too. Believe it or not, for $7 a month, there were people that would try to stiff the paper boy. Yeah. Right? And, then, and back in those days, not only did we deliver the papers, but we had to write checks for the papers to the Journal Star. And then whatever was left over was our profit. Oh, and, yeah. They and, put that burden on you. Yeah. And so you had to collect the money. And I had You're a days. Collector. Yeah, yeah. We had to go out, <laughs> you know, we had to hustle. And and if you know, I had days where uh it was close. I didn't collect enough money, the money was due. Yeah. And I would turn in my 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 bag of checks and a couple of them would bounce. And then guess what? My check would bounce. Right. Oh, no. And so at, at at you know, 10 years old, I'm writing hot checks because my customers aren't are writing me hot checks, right? <laughs> yeah, and so you learned I learned about accounts receivable when you're ten. <laughs> yeah, so I learned about accounts receivable when I was ten years old, and uh, yeah, and I also had a, a grandfather that was a farmer in Wahoo, Nebraska. I, but he was also a, a very big into investing in the stock market, and they had a gas pipe that ran through their farmland, which was owned uh, by a company that eventually became Enron. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't sell it in time. <laughs> but, but so yeah, he, he taught timing. a little bit about investing. But uh, my, you know, my both my parents are very entrepreneurial in nature. Um, you know, I'm a one of four kids, and as we were growing up, you know, my mom got her MBA, mm -hmm. uh, even though my dad was an attorney, practicing attorney, and you know, it was a very. Uh, like I said, not a lot of supervision or structure, but a lot of accountability and responsibility. Interesting. 
So what did that, what was the form of that? So they'd be like, okay, well you can go party on the weekends, but uh, like in high school, like how did, how did that go? Like in high school when it came to like, you had a lot of accountability, but not a lot of structure. What did that look like? Sure. So, I mean, <laughs> I think I can only remember one time where I actually got in trouble and that was in seventh grade when um, I was out with some friends downtown till about one or two in the morning. And it's they were grade. upset. Yeah, I think it was the summer. <laughs> it was around seventh grade, summer after seventh grade. Uh, and, you know, and I think I might have been grounded for a day. Uh, my friends were grounded <laughs> for a week. But but th at that time, I had responsibilities. I had a paper out. I had other things I had to do. And, uh, you know, I, I learned my lesson and I, and I, and I moved on. And I think... Uh, that helped me quite a bit. When I was 16 years old, my, my father gave me the opportunity to go to military school at New Mexico Military Institute. Now think about this. I was 16. I had a wow. 1965 Mustang. I had a girlfriend. Everything was going well. That was good. Yeah. But here was an opportunity. And you know, my dad uh, had got that opportunity. And I just thought, this is an opportunity for me to go somewhere and really focus. And so I went to military school and there was a mandatory study hall. And that's where I really excelled at athletics. And, you know, to some degree, academics. And then... Um, I graduated in 1993. It's an important year because all my friends that stayed at Southeast and East High School uh, who were great football players went to the University of Nebraska. And so uh, I went to William & Mary, mm -hmm. uh, had a brief football career there, played with some guys who are now NFL head coaches like Mike Tomlin and Sean McDermott. Oh, Dan wow. Quinn was a defensive line coach there at the time. But my buddies that uh, stayed at Nebraska, University of Nebraska uh, like John Zadiska, Eric Anderson, they have three national championship rings, 94, 95, and 97. So What a time. Uh, yeah, yeah, so what a time. <laughs> and, of course, my friends at William & Mary would be, you know, we were, we were what was called 1AA, Division 1AA. It's now okay. FCS. But, uh, yeah, they were impressed. You know, I was from Nebraska, right? Where yeah. Had the you had some brand now. Yeah, you had some yeah. brand behind you. <laughs> yeah, so I had some credibility. Uh, but that was a short uh, uh, two-season career. And, uh, and I, I got injured and I was gonna have to sit out a year. Oh, okay. And I, I realized, you know, football in college is a lot different than high school. Um, it's a 40 hour a week job when you start going to the weight room, to the training room, watching film, team meetings. It's just, there's a lot yeah. to it. And William and Mary's a very demanding college. And so I thought, man, if I'm gonna sit out for a year, I, I just don't know that this is what I wanna do. Right. And, and they let my body heal and so, I decided I still wanted a challenge. And I'd spent most of my uh, college career trying to gain weight to play football. Right. And, and it had always been a challenge. And I thought a lot about you know, how I was eating seven meals a day and really pushing myself to do it. I thought, what could be the next challenge? And the next challenge for me, was I'd heard about Army Ranger School, where people mm -hmm. were going into the school. Uh, they deprive you of food and sleep. They push you. People are losing 50 pounds. I thought, man, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. I, mean, I love eating. I, and I eat all the time. And I still can't gain the weight that I wanted to play <laughs> football. And I thought, you know, this is interesting. And so it's challenging. And I wanted to jump out of airplanes. And I wanted to travel. And I wanted the excitement. And so I uh, signed up for the ROTC program the last couple of years of uh, my college career. I uh, earned a scholarship, and in uh, 1997, I was commissioned as an infantry officer and went to Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Got to go to Airborne School, Ranger School, yep. and do all that fun stuff. And then I was sent out to Fort Hood, Texas, deployed to Bosnia in 1999, and then came back and uh, went to law school, but stayed in the, in the National Guard. I ended up deploying to Iraq a few years later mm -hmm. and uh, and then came back and ended up finishing a 20-year career in the Nebraska National Guard that later helped me quite a bit in, in business. And I'll, right. I'll explain that. But from the perspective of um, you know, having two jobs, but also being a, I was a, had two company commands and a battalion command. And a lot of times as commander, uh, you can't be there in a reserve component unit. And you may have... Uh, soldiers in all parts of the state. You Got may it. have different units in different parts of the state where you have a drill weekend. Let's say you're a company commander. You have three platoons that are spread out in three different cities yeah. or you're a battalion commander. You've got companies spread out in different uh, cities and towns throughout Nebraska. How do you lead? And you really have to, you know, it really taught me how to be good with my time. It taught me how to delegate and how to be impactful. You can't scale your time. No. So you have to have an impact and you have to come out with a clear message that uh, your subordinate leaders can understand. You have to be able to delegate. You have to be able to empower them. Right. But you got to hold them responsible, got to hold them accountable. And, you know, ultimately, um, and the responsibility lies with you, whether you're there or not. Yeah. What prepared you for that? I mean, obviously, like, you know, going to Iraq and Bosnia, you know, you're, you're already getting a lot of, you know, experience within leadership there. But like you were basically leading, I mean, if you think about it, like three companies, you know, three businesses, like right. all, all in different places. So what, what prepared you for that? Like, what was a defining moment that really helped prepare you to take that on? 
I think early on in, 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 in a military career, especially as an infantry officer, when you when you patrol, you generally have a security element out on the flanks. You have a support by fire element and an assault element. So you ha- you're running three elements that you have to coordinate. You have to coordinate the security with the support by fire that's going to lay down the suppressive fire. And then you have to have the assault uh, team that's going to assault through the objective. So you're coordinating three teams. Mm-hmm. And if you screw up the coordination, you're going to get friendly fire. Someone's right. going to get shot. Yep. So you have to meticulously plan. You have to work through the details. Uh, you do backwards planning with your timelines. And you pay attention to the key details. You delegate. You do back briefs. So you ask your subordinates, what is going to happen at X point in in this, and you have to set decision points. At what point, what decisions do I have to make? And so I think very early on in the military career, I I learned about strategy, I learned about tactics, I learned that the tactics have to support the strategy, and the planning has to be meticulous, and that no plan survives first contact. Once bullets start flying down range, the plan's gonna change, but if you've done the planning, you've thought through the scenarios, you always have a contingency plan, and you always make sure that you back brief your team or have them back brief you so that they can articulate exactly what you told them. I love like, that. Yeah, I tell you what, in coaching, it's the same thing. I have people come to my office, I tell them something, and they leave thinking something totally different. And that's, I, I, you know, I learned that in the civilian side, so I, I do the same military technique. Okay, what did I just tell you? Right. Or what are you going to go do? And when usually they give me the answer that if they tell me what I told them, they parrot it back. But a lot of times that's not the case. Right. They're and, like 50% or like yeah, 25% yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes it's, a, you know, it's one of those things where maybe uh, they got a little bit too emotionally invested in their performance and we're telling them you didn't do this right. And all they hear is you suck. Right. Defensive. They don't hear, mm-hmm. okay, this is how we're going to do this better. And, you know, feedback is a gift. And I, 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 I love that. <laughs> so it took much. me till I was 40 years old to really learn that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, unfortunately, your ego gets in the way sometimes, and and it's tough to take that that critical feedback. Right. But uh, it has helped me quite helped me quite a bit in my career. So I know I gave you a lot of information no, there, but I that's how that. the military prepared me for business. Right. Yeah. So that specifically, like even looking back at that back briefing thing, I love how you. I, I've never heard anyone talk about reversing the timeline though. Because if you think about it, like everyone's like, oh, step A, step B, step, you know, step C, and like all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, what if step B goes away because step A never happened? You know, AKA your con- contingency plan. And you're saying, no, reverse that from the very end. What do we actually do at that point? Yeah, That's yeah, smart. yeah. I mean, think about it. What does success look like? What is the end state? What are you trying to achieve? When are you going to achieve it? All right, that's what goes on the timeline. You have to say what it looks like. There's a great coach out there named Dan Sullivan. He uses an impact filter. That oh it's God. a it's a one page document. Did this today. Just did yeah. this today. Okay, you yeah, do yeah. you do that, and, and I ha- I have my marketing team do it. Sometimes I have my my lawyers do it as well, and say, okay, you want to do this event. What does success look like? Mm-hmm. But then I take it a step further and say, okay, if that's the end state, let's walk back. How do we get there? And let's start with the end in mind and walk backwards and then we'll plan our events from there and then we'll attach the times, the dates, and the person. Another Dan Sullivan, who, not how. Right. As you as you scale a business, you learn that you can't be the best at everything. Right. And the thing that will prevent you from being the best at everything is yep. being excellent at a few things, right? And so th- there are things that you think you do well and there are things that you do well Objectively, right? There are things I probably think I do really well, but I'm horrible. (laughs) Uh, There are things that objectively I do well, but what are the things in your unique abilities that you really love to do? You're really good at it. You're better than anybody, Mm -hmm. right? The problem with, I think, a lot of times in business is to be successful, you have to get good at a lot of things, even excellent at a lot of things. Uh, and and we are too slow to delegate those things because no one can do them as good as us. We don't want so to do think. them. So they, <laughs> yeah, they suck the life out of us to do them, but we know that if we want it done to standard, we have to do it ourselves. And so we, we fail to train people. We fail to take that risk, turn over the keys and say, right. this is now yours. I, I've struggled with that with things like legal writing. At Creighton Law School, I won the Cali Award in uh, advanced legal writing. 
I had the highest grade. And yeah. so I don't have time to do a ton of legal writing when I'm in the courtroom, um, when I'm running the business. And so I had to you know, delegate that to people. Right. Find people who are better writers than me. Exactly. And sometimes you can train people, sometimes you just have to find them. And the question is, would you rather pay more upfront for the person who's qualified, or do you wanna pay and do you wanna take the risk of training them? And, and so for me, there were things like that. Uh, that I just, I, I felt like I had to do, right. but I really didn't. And, and I got better at delegating and said, okay, what's my unique ability? Mm -hmm. What am I really good at? What am I better than everybody else at? Because that's the thing you grab onto. What and is that, that, by the way? What, what, do, you, what I, do you believe that is? I, I don't think, I think it's one thing for some people, but for me, uh, the unique ability that, that I think I'm really good at, that I love to do, I love to try cases, I love public speaking, and I love coaching champions. Right in my organization, yeah. right, and so I'm not, you know, I'm not a coach on this. I know some people have coaching businesses. That's not me. No. But I do love coaching individuals, and I think going back to when I was happiest, I was a young 22 year old platoon leader in Fort Hood, Texas, and I would show up for physical training every morning at 5:30. My senior non commissioned officers would already be there, and we got 30 people in this platoon, and it was like being on a championship team. Every yeah. morning, everybody's working towards a goal. Everybody wants to be the best. Being a part of that, that's my unique ability. Yeah. When I'm in that zone, I'll do anything. I, I don't get tired. I feel like I could just go on for mm -hmm. days and days and days. When I'm surrounded by champions working toward a serious you know, mission, a, a yeah. life or death mission, to me that is, that's living. Yeah. And if I can be in that zone, then I can work in my unique ability, which I, unfortunately now I'm 45, but back in the day, you know, I, it probably <laughs> I would say that that unique ability as a platoon leader was a combination of physical fitness, intelligence, um, and grit. Yeah. Now I, I, there's still some grit to it, but it really is about getting out there and communicating our message. Whether I'm communicating the message on behalf of a client to a jury, or whether I'm communicating that message to my team. Right, it makes a ton of sense. And you know, you, you, you crossed something there a little bit about like the warrior ethos. You didn't actually mention it, but you kind of referred to it. So talk about how you developed that within yourself and then also brought that to Barry Law Firm. And I think uh, your dad also had a lot to do with that. Being a Vien Vietnam veteran obviously has a lot to do with it, but how did you carry that on now as the president and CEO? Sure. So. Well, one easy way is I made warrior ethos one of our core values. Right. <laughs> Put it at the yeah. top of the page, right? Right, right. And, and you know, warrior ethos, really, everybody gets knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. And you don't, when you get up, you don't dust yourself off. You get up and you swing back. That's warrior ethos. And Love that. That's, that's the way you have to uh, set the example. Because when your teammates are getting knocked down, they're, you can tell them whatever you want, but they're looking at what you do. And if you get up and you take time to dust yourself off before you swing back, that's what they're going to do. But if they see you get knocked down and pummeled and you get back up and you come up swinging, yeah, they're going to do what you do. You know, the subordinates are not much different than your kids. It's leadership by example. They see what you do. And if you have that warrior ethos, they're going to adopt it or they're going to leave. Because champions love champions. Mm -hmm. Mediocre people hate champions. And champions hate mediocre people. And, <laughs> and so when you have a very strong warrior ethos, it either, it either attracts the right people or it repels the wrong people. In a very, very large way. Like, oh yeah, they can spot it from a mile away. They're like, I want nothing to do with that guy. Or like, that's my dude. Yeah, yeah, right. you gotta say, man, that guy's crazy. Yeah. I want nothing. I, or, or yeah, like I, I look at that, that guy's crazy. I probably should have him on my podcast. <laughs> yeah. well, I, was, I was reading you know, about uh, Kobe Bryant. He talked about his investments. Right. And he was investing. And he said, well, how do you determine how you're investing in companies? Yeah, after he recently retired, he said, I look for my obsessives. You know, people like me who are just absolutely obsessed mm -hmm. with winning. Uh, one of the best books I've read is Relentless by Tim Grover, yes. who was Kobe Bryant's trainer, mm -hmm. right? And you think about most people when they think that they, they, they've made it. The... Uh, the NBA draft, right? What was Kobe doing the night of the NBA draft? Do you remember? Shooting free throws, probably. Yeah, he was back yeah. in the gym. Yeah. Everybody else is celebrating. For him, I think it was probably the scariest moment of his life because now's my shot. This isn't the time to celebrate. This is the time. This is my opportunity, and I don't want to let this opportunity go. And I know I get one shot. And think about Jordan, right? Even when Jordan won the, the championships, what was he doing? If he had two championships, right afterwards, he'd hold up the third finger and it was time to get to work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't time to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, some people that 
scares them to death. That I don't oh. want to work with somebody who's going to keep pushing me. I remember Grover talking about uh, talking about Kobe and Jordan both. Like they would call him like it's three o'clock in the morning, and uh, he gets a phone call from Kobe, and he's like, uh, "Meet me at the gym at three thirty. Like we got to start shooting." He's like, "You just spent all night. Like we were there till ten thirty. Like I think you need to get some rest." He's like, "No, I'll see you there at three thirty. And Grover's like, "Shit." Now I have to show up at the gym because he's going to be there and I got to be ready to train him. And that's exactly like just just that statement alone shows you the sort of work ethic that those guys had and like the obsessive. Yeah, and I think a lot of it's attitude. I remember um, yeah. when I was a battalion commander at the uh, Regional Training Institute for the Officer Candidate School classes, we had two classes coming in. My goal, I, always, I would always want to set the example, score 300 on the Army Physical Fitness Test, perfect mm -hmm. score. And so I would want to set the example for the candidates and I had one year where for some reason, we couldn't run them both together. Mm -hmm. And so we had to do one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So I said, well, I'm gonna set the example. So I ended up doing two physical fitness tests that day. And I remember one of them, I think it was the Army birthday, or the maybe it was the National Guard birthday. I can't remember, there was something, and I had to give a speech in between and be on, and you know, I was, I, I, I did a physical fitness test in the morning, gave everything I had to max it out and beat those, you know, 25 year old kids. Right? <laughs> and then, and then in the afternoon, and I even ate cake at this celebration, you know, <laughs> so my sugar, Game I mean, all the sugar. <laughs> and I remember doing the second test and I said, but I told him I was going to do it and I was going to do it with him. I don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And so I put myself in that position. And I think that sometimes as leaders, we do that. So yeah, I call the trainer at three thirty in the morning. I'm going to the gym. Uh, it forces us, it holds us accountable when exactly. we throw that out there. And so some people say, I think Tim Grover said, say, you know, you, people who know don't talk, right? But I can tell you sometimes if you talk, you'll put yourself in a position, especially if you're a leader, where now you've said it, your subordinates are gonna hold you accountable, you better do it. 100%, 100%, I love that. Like that self accountability of saying like, well, we're gonna hit this goal this year. Um, I remember talking to a couple of people in your company about how you want a 10X growth every year like or you're working towards that 10x yeah on 10X. Yeah, not, yeah is it 10 so, by 10 by 10 is that what you is that what you call yeah, yeah. it yeah i think 10x growth over over, over 10, 10 years, years. sorry 10 yeah. years yeah and, and i'll tell you I, dan sullivan made me a little bit smarter about this he said you know he said look you know take it quarter by quarter and you know you don't have to go that fast you know think about it in the long term and and you don't have to maintain that rate but here's the thing you've got to go fast you've got to grow fast or else why would anybody follow you it Amen. is much scarier to be in a business that's growing two to three percent a year than a company that's growing thirty percent. Oh God, couldn't agree more. I, I mean, couldn't agree more. Hundred percent. There's yeah. no homeostasis in business. You're either you're either growing or you're dying. Exactly. And I can't imagine being in an organization where everybody just kind of wants to keep everything the same because that tells me we're we're, we're dying. Because yeah. there's always somebody out there who's younger, faster, hungrier, smarter, and 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 they're waiting to take your place. And if you're not, you know, if you're not pushing it. Somebody else is going to overtake you. And by the way, the rock stars, the ones you want on your team, they want nothing to do with someone who's complacent. Two to three percent growth doesn't doesn't uh, really appeal to them. Absolutely not. Right. And so you have absolutely lived what you're talking about. You've got some probably really exciting cases. Can you talk about any of them? And if so, what's some of your most exciting stories, most exciting victories uh, in the criminal defense area? Sure. I mean... What I love about the practice of law is that every day you get the chance to win or lose, and it matters. Someone comes to us and says, help me, mm -hmm. right? We, you know, as lawyers, we take on clients, not causes. And right. so the biggest wins are the cases we've won for the clients who, who had the courage to put it all on the line. Um, we actually have a great video on our website near our testimonials about a client that was acquitted of some hor horrific allegations. And we actually had a camera crew and they were gonna do some veterans law stuff and we were waiting, we waited six days for a jury verdict and he was found not guilty oh, and he told his story, you know? And, and a lot of times lawyers will say, well, you know, when we, when we have a case, we always wanna make the jury the hero in the story because mm -hmm. ultimately we wanna show that they're the ones that uphold the justice. But sometimes you get a client, and really the client's the hero, the person who's been falsely accused, who steps up and says, you know what, I didn't do this, and I'm gonna fight this till the end. I don't care if the state wants to offer me a misdemeanor. I don't care if they wanna uh, write me a letter of apology. I'm gonna to prove to the world did I and I you know and we always tell look criminal defense lawyers you don't have to prove anything. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so we we we've had those cases uh, that I love and I, I received on Christmas uh, Christmas Eve I received a an email from a a uh, 
client's father and the client uh, had been through quite a bit. We won the case and the dad wrote just, hey, thanks to you, I have my son over Christmas, which, you know, it's it's heartbreaking to be a father to know that that could happen to your child. Right. Be falsely accused and go to prison for a long time. And we won that one and, and that's good. But there's also veterans that we've helped where we got them hundreds of thousands of dollars in back pay award veterans who were homeless and the VA did not pay them their disability benefits. Nobody took care of them. Nobody gave them their medical benefits. These are benefits that they earned. Right. And so those are huge wins. I mean, the, those are the ones that have the impact on our team, yeah. right? Where it's like, you know, we did something amazing. We saved a life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, uh, great. there's nothing better than, than a grateful client who says, yeah. you know, thank you. And, and, and they don't just say, oh, thanks, John. No. They ju- reach out to the whole team. And, and as a leader, you want to give credit to the team. What I love is our, our most grateful clients, they, they know that it, it's a team effort. And they, they pay attention to how we do things. And they mm-hmm. say, and I know that so-and-so did this, and Jim did this, and Sally did that, and you guys all made a difference. And and I'm always quick to give other people credit. As a leader, you have to. Give Absolutely. the team credit and then take the blame when things go wrong. Um, but I said, the, the, the clients notice how hard the team works. Yeah. And sometimes as the lawyer, you may look like the star <clears throat> of the team, but, but at the end of the day, uh, you're relying on the rest of the team to set you up for success. 100%. Yeah, and and you know, yeah, you're out there. <laughs> you take the glory when you win sometimes, because uh, you're the face, and you take the beating when you lose. And so, some people are very happy to not be in the spotlight. And I've learned that where I've tried to sometimes congratulate people for their their great work and thrust them into the spotlight and say, "No, it wasn't me. It was this person." And then they're yeah. upset. They're saying, "No, no, like, no, I didn't do I, that. <laughs> no, I just want to be in the background. Right. Please, please understand that this is this is who I am." You know, and. That's one of the more difficult things, I think, as an entrepreneur and as a, as a leader. Not everybody's like you. you know, I made some horrible mistakes early on where I thought, you know, people are like me. What if I offer to pay someone about 50% less than market, the market rate, but offer them huge bonuses for hitting certain targets? Mm-hmm. Right? They're, they're, that way I'll, I'll attract people like me. Well, that was the wrong answer, yeah. right? Because in any organizations you grow, you need people who aren't, you know, who, 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 are, who kind of want to live a comfortable lifestyle and want to get the job done every day, mm-hmm. but don't necessarily want to take the risks that you take. That's the, crazy, the, too, because of like how aggressive, like in criminal defense, like you're really like, I mean, it's pretty confrontational. You're confrontational people. You're aggressive people. Like you have to be that way to be good. Yeah. So you're finding what's really interesting is like your bi- your vision is big enough that there's fits inside of it, and that's the most important thing. Like you talk about how nobody's comfortable with two and a half percent growth. If you told your team we're growing by two and a half percent, hopefully next year, they'd look at you and be like, "Excuse me, right?" Oh yeah, yeah. No, the right people, the people that are the right people right now would leave. <laughs> but, but <I laughs> yeah, there you, there you go. But what I didn't <clears throat> understand is there are people who are very happy to make a comfortable salary. Everybody wants an upshot, you know, but there are a lot of people that would rather have the security. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my mind, security is false, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, if let's just say that Grindstone goes broke tomorrow, Mm -hmm. you lose everything. Your employees, they may be out some money. Mm -hmm. You know, they they may not get their paycheck or they may have to go look for a job. But when Grindstone's done, if you're the only investor, you're probably going to lose everything, if not close to everything. Everything, yeah. yeah. And so, not everybody wants that. Not everybody right. wants that and risk. That, that was hard for you to understand at the beginning. Is that, right. is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I just assumed that everybody wanted the risk. I assumed they wanted the risk, they wanted the reward. Right. Uh, what they? Because I guess what they didn't want to hear, which is the truth, is that it could all be gone tomorrow. Think about what happened in 2008. All these people who thought that they had these strong pensions, that they had jobs that would last forever. And as these companies crumbled, Mm -hmm. I found out that that security was false. Right. And the truth is that security really doesn't exist. For anybody. For anybody. Yeah. I mean, I think you could probably say, well, I'll get a government job and I'll... But even then. Yeah. But even then, you know, we've heard about government shutdowns, government freezes. uh, And quite frankly, even then, there's not not safety. Nothing's guaranteed. Uh, So I was watching a video with a a big hedge fund manager or the founder of like a... Excuse me, it was a VC firm. And uh, it was... I think it's Blackstone. Yeah. The Blackstone VC. And he was talking about how entrepreneurs actually don't really even take on risk. They just make decisions and it's not necessarily a risk to them when they're making the decisions because they just think they're making the best decision and a risk to them is stagnation. What do you yeah, think about well, that? Well, I think, I think that's fairly, uh, 
narrow view. Okay. Actually, I think it's downright stupid. Okay. Tell me why. One thing I learned in the military was we, we do risk assessments, right? We calculate risk every day. We figure out what is the, uh, what could be the most catastrophic thing that could happen? What's the likelihood mm-hmm. of the catastrophic event? How do we mitigate risk against that? Um, and so every day we're making decisions and we have to understand that there is risk out there. When I was a young lieutenant at Fort Benning, my father and I went to the officers club. There used to be officers clubs. You okay. go there, it's kind of like a bar yeah. and a restaurant. And we were sitting at the bar, ordered some food, and this uh, Lieutenant Colonel Green Beret, Special Forces, sat next to us and he's talking to my dad. And my dad, as I said, had defended the command of the 5th Special Forces in Vietnam. So my dad started talking with him and mm-hmm. they had some mutual friends. And he said, well, let me give you some advice, Lieutenant. Leaders take risks. Don't take dumb risks, take calculated risks. Mm -hmm. So to say that entrepreneurs don't take risks, uh, no, they take risks all the time. The question is whether they take calculated risks. Um, To say, well, we know we gotta keep growing, we know we have to do this. I agree, if his point in in this, and I I didn't hear what he said, so I won't bash him too much. Yeah, and I was was obviously paraphrasing within it, so yeah, there's probably room for it. And I don't know, sometimes people don't like venture capitalists. uh, Yeah, of course. And and they have a different view of the entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why the entrepreneurs usually call them vulture capitalists. And I think in, (laughs) you know, I think it was in, uh, I think both Joe Ricketts and uh, Dick Stack said, or I, I'm sorry, Ed Stack said, run away <laughs> when you see them coming. Yep. Um, because they're not your friend, they're not here to help you. Now, I wouldn't know. I would. Ha- I have no idea. I've never worked with a venture capitalist, but I've worked a lot with risk, mm-hmm. all right? I've worked with risk mitigation with my clients in terms of, hey, if we try this case, you're looking at 20 years to life, we've got an opportunity where you can do five years in prison. What do you want to do? Well, we got to calculate risk. What's the probability of us winning this case? Well, I don't know. How do we calculate probability? Well, let's take a look at the good facts. Let's take a look at the bad facts. Let's talk about what our theme is, what our theory is. Let's talk about the strengths of the witnesses. And let's try to attach a number to say, this is where I think the the odds lie. So we are calculating risk. Trial lawyers take risks all the time. Um, Even in our injury cases, there may be an offer on the table for $100,000, but we think that our client is entitled to $2 million. Do we go to trial and try to get the whole justice, the $2 million, or do we take the $100,000? Uh, you know, that's a decision the client has to make and we have to advise the client. Right. So ultimately, yeah, the, 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 it sounds like the, the quote you heard, the guy would say, well, no, you just automatically go for the, the, the two million. But that isn't true. Ethically, as it turns right. we can't do that. But from an entrepreneurial standpoint, the answer is no, absolutely <laughs> not. You're taking risks every day. Yeah. Uh, whether you decide to invest in a marketing opportunity, like let's say uh, OTT, right. or yeah. whether you Netflix, decide to say, yeah. uh, you, you, d- you decide to invest in your uh, local cable network, <laughs> right? You're taking a risk right. either way, yeah. and you have to calculate that risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, every action you take, there is a risk. Uh, I think as an entrepreneur, you're just, you're not handicapped by it. But that doesn't mean you can't be aware. That is exactly the difference. Yeah, you have to be that aware. That getting at is the fact that like they're not, it's not something that's like debilitating. It's like, we have to make a decision. We're not gonna stop. We have to move forward somehow. So I'm looking forward to like reviewing that clip and then watching your response to that because, and I'll make sure and send it to you too. And uh, so while we're, on the, while we're on the controversial topics, we have to talk about work-life balance. Does it exist in your opinion? If you want something, you have to give up something else. Um, I know people that are very successful at work-life balance. The head of our veterans law law practice is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. She shows up at eight, she's done by five, and she's out. She also had a- What's that? She hits the switch. switch. Yeah. You know, she did a year in uh, in Australia. Her husband uh, worked for Huddle, Mm -hmm. and they went down to Australia, and you know what? She stayed on board and had a phenomenal year. Mm -hmm. And she's one of those people that she shows up She's wired in and she can turn it off. And that's great. Mm-hmm. That's not me. That's not you. <laughs> no, and, and, and to be fair, I mean, I, I think it's also diff- a little bit different as a trial lawyer. Your cases haunt you. Right. So if you think about it, I think it's, it, it, which is probably a good thing because as an entrepreneur, you're probably, it's very difficult to shut your brain off, mm-hmm. right? At the end of the day, there's always something to be done. And if you're always trying to get better, you're always thinking, always trying to improve yourself, always trying to improve your team, always trying to improve their situation, uh, your brain never really shuts off. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it was either, I'm either worried about a case or I'm thinking about the organization, our team, our future. and 
the difficult thing is not following through with the planning, right? It's easy to get out a calendar. I do this every year, um, usually 18 months in advance. And I will, first thing I do is block off my vacation days. Mm-hmm. Then next is like my important events, like my travel days, um, the important seminars I'm gonna speak at, uh, things that are really huge, right? The, right. the, the 10X possibilities, how can I, t- the, the, the opportunities that may 10X the organization. And then I, I, I work from there. And then whatever's open falls in, right? Mm-hmm. But the big thing is always the vacations. And I could leave work every day, I tried this once four, five o'clock, but guess what? You you can't just turn your brain off, no. or at least I can't. And so uh, while I would do that, it, it didn't always, it didn't always uh, work out the way I planned for it to. And I've, I had a, I have a friend in Omaha who runs a, a large business and we, we have lunch every now and then. And he said, you know, it's, it's a sickness, <laughs> you know, that I can't, I can't turn it off. Yeah, and I absolutely. thought that was, I thought that was a good way, good way of putting it. Cause I know a lot of people that can turn it off, but I think for entrepreneurs, there's so much going on. It's so hard to turn it off. One thing that I do, I get up every day at 5 a.m. Um, I will journal a little bit, plan out my day if I haven't done it the night before, mm-hmm. uh, before I uh, before I go to the gym, maybe even do a little bit of work before I go to the gym. But I start, I, I win the mornings and then I can live with what happens during the day. So as long as I 100%. get up early, you know, have some focus time, get a workout and hey, how about something healthy for breakfast? After that, Hey, it doesn't matter. I, I won the day. And oh, I 100 percent am with you in that. I do the exact same thing, and I feel the days when I don't do it. I'm sure you do too. Like if there's days when that doesn't happen for you, yep. it's a little bit different. And uh, but that's, that's as close as I get to work work life balance. Yeah, is you know? maintaining so like a success over the day, right? Like winning the day. And yep. I'm a big believer in that too. Um, so who are some of your mentors growing up? Who taught you? I mean, obviously you had several people inside the military that probably molded you into the person. Your dad. Um, who else was a mentor for you? I, you know, yeah, I think my my dad definitely, and, and probably my, my grandfather that I never met on my dad's side, he owned several lumber mills in Iowa. There's okay. still, Barry Lumber Company is still there um, out in Ottawa, Iowa. And uh, and this is before Home Depot. And so he was, uh, you know, the, hearing the stories about him as a businessman, not only his uh, his generosity, but his business sense. And he, uh, he was kind of a, a legend mm-hmm. in some of the smaller How towns so? in Iowa. Uh, just known for... Uh, being successful, being a shrewd businessman, being extremely generous, mm-hmm. uh, and being a pillar in the community. Yep. And so I hear a lot of stories about that. I, I think back to, yeah, I mean, I definitely my, my father, who is not a great businessman, but a phenomenal trial attorney, brilliant man. Um, I never, I'll never be as good of a lawyer as him. He also, for a lot of people know this, he had his own radio show on the drive time, what was what is now drive time Lincoln. He owned that spot, I think for about 10 years. No way. He was paid to be on the radio. You know, most lawyers <laughs> will pay to be on the radio. They actually paid him. He ran, uh, he was just a great personality. So wow. I learned a lot um, from him about, you know, be, how to be really good at, at, at what you love to do. Um, but once again, there wasn't a whole lot of work-life balance there for him either. You know, the phone would ring all the time in our house. This is, you know, we had yeah. the, 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 the dial-up ringer and it would ring all the time. And, uh, you know, and my, I don't think my mom liked it much. And of course, you know, we got four young kids and it'd ring at all times during the day. And my dad would say, you know, you may not appreciate that now, but that's the sound of a cash register. <laughs> and it's better that clients are calling in and hiring me than than not. Exactly. And so I, you know, I learned that I think from him. And I said, my my mom's always been very um, entrepreneurial. Uh, she's always uh, is an avid reader, mm-hmm. um, and um, and is also an artist. Travels a lot. And so I, I I learned I think to appreciate life a lot more from her. You know that. If, if there's any work-life balance, I can probably attribute it to her. She's yeah. try, always encouraged me to do that. But my dad's encouraged me to travel, too. And usually the last piece of advice he'll give me before I try a case is get a good night's sleep and have fun. So, yeah, I, I think that my parents have been a great influence. Um, I've had a ton of subordinate leaders, people who have surpassed me. And as a leader, that's the greatest compliment. Yeah. Uh, people who I've helped and challenged and and they came back and, and did amazing things. Th- those have greatly influenced me because it's addictive, right? You say, wow, 
I took part in, 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 in developing this person who has now surpassed me. I want to do it again. 100%. Um, there are people yeah. in, my, in my law firm, our general counsel, Andy Straubman, former Marine, um, and he was then general counsel of a large law firm. He was a great mentor as I was a young attorney. He always helped other attorneys, even though we were on the other, first time I met him, we were on the opposite sides of a case. Oh, okay. Uh, he represented a large organization in town. I represented someone who had allegedly stolen money from them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, at the end of the thing, a lot of, I think that it ended with a lot of mutual respect. And years later, um, I was fortunate enough to convince him to come work with us. And he is always, uh, while I am always going 200 miles an hour, he's the guy that will say, hey, you may want to slow down. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the guys that really understands risk a lot better than me. And I'll, you know, and I'll see some of the risks, but he'll see stuff that I never saw coming. Right. And part of that comes with experience. He's been there. He's, you know, worked at a firm uh, three times the size of ours, wow. and he knows what's coming. And I've. And I've met with other business owners of, of large organizations who have advisory boards, and they say, you know, the real value is you can talk to someone who's been there. Right. And, and they know what's coming. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, yeah, people like that have made a huge difference in my life. There are several coaches, you know, friends, uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the military who have been there for me. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I, I think it's really about being receptive no matter who's out there, and shutting out the people who are not going to bring value into your life. I think it's who's not in your life is as important as who is in your life. They did it like a study on obesity, right? You probably heard this. Yeah. Uh, you know, obesity is contagious. You hang, if you hang out with obese people, you're probably going to become obese. Right. Another study, they, they took kids from troubled backgrounds, brought them in with the good kids, with the good grades, who are doing everything right, and they thought that it would bring up the troubled kid. No, just the opposite. The troubled kid brought down the good kids. Yep. And so it is your environment is your looking glass, mm -hmm. and that's how you see the world, and, and you have to surround yourself with champions because if you don't, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get pulled down, and right. and Kobe brought that. I you know, I, I listened to one of his uh, la final interviews, and he said, yeah, you know, the people that were there in high school, the people that were around, you know, some people I don't have work life balance, and uh, and the people that don't appreciate that, they're not in my life. Right, exactly. Yep, the the people that you confide in, and those are the people that you know are gonna support you even when you're in the office grinding until one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Absolutely. And that's uh, I've found that exact thing is. Um, cause I've caught a lot, you know, even just like early in my state, I'm only 27 starting this now. And, um, I've already been catching some shit about like, oh, you're, you know, you, you have any work-life balance. How do your friends feel? You know, do you don't have much of a social life, that sort of thing. And I'm just sitting here, I'm like, I'm happy, you know, like I'm happy doing this. Like I'm not miserable when I'm miserable, I'll stop doing it. It's pretty easy, right? Make you, makes you, you'll make the decision. Yeah. I mean, I'm happiest mm. when I'm fully engaged 100%. where I have got a lot going on, even if it's bad, at least. It, it's going and my brain is working and I feel like uh, things are happening, good or bad, that's yeah. great. And I think, you know, in my 40s, I, I have the life I've dreamed of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's tough, but I, mean, I, I love my work. I love what I do. I love uh, leading uh, champions. I love, uh, I love trying cases. And I, it was just, I was in Aspen, Colorado last week and I got the opportunity to speak at the uh, National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers Advanced Criminal Law Seminar in Aspen. Hey, I got some skiing in. I got to give a presentation <laughs> to some good. of the top criminal defense attorneys in the country. It was, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. Right. Oh, and there were parties every night, you know, and it was, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Right and, and, and I got to, you know, and, and, and the thing is, it's just a different crowd, right? The people I'm hanging out with at these parties, uh, these guys aren't the guys who are going to party till four in the morning. Um, they're going to go out, and, but you're going to have a good conversation. You're going to make good connections, and you, you share that. You, you can share experiences, and it is work to some degree because you're, yeah. you're not turned off. And in fact, you're usually picking up quite a lot more in those situations. Oh, yeah. If you go to seminars, conferences, you find out you learn a lot more uh, from what's not from the, the presentations, but from the other conversations and the relationships you build, the referral partners uh, that you can find. I, I, you know, I, I, I love traveling and, and doing that and, and, and meeting those people and learning. Uh, how people in other parts of our country have similar businesses, learning their challenges, how mm -hmm. they're overcoming them. There's so much you can take away. And for me, learning is, uh, you know, I love learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, learning's a great high, right? If yeah. you can, 
as you it can be fully engaged, learn something, take it away, try to implement it. I mean, I, I love that. So I get to travel a lot. I get to learn from other people. Like I said, I get to work with a lot of great clients in our veterans practice. I get to learn the stories of our nation's heroes. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and yeah, there's a lot of grinding to it. There's a lot of hard work, no question about it. But at the end of the day, there's nothing I'd rather do. Yeah, and, and you, you mentioned something there, like you know, it's a lot of grinding. What happens when a law sneaks up on you, something that really catches you off guard. You you talk about how cases haunt you. You know, so you're, you're, you're at this constant high where you're like, as long as I'm moving forward, good or bad, um, I'm happy. So what happens when the bad hits and how long does that affect you? And like, what do you do to separate yourself as John from that loss and continue to move forward um, with those cases that seem to haunt you? Yeah, I mean, I used to let it eat me alive. Like right. how, so like, what would that look like? I mean, it w- I would still go to work. I'd still do everything, but in the back of my mind, it would bother me. And so in the, in the professional sense, it wouldn't affect me at all. I'd be back the next day for no- even hungrier, ready for another mm-hmm. kill, right? Yep, ready for another kill. <laughs> but then what would happen is I'd come home, right? Mm-hmm. And it would affect more, you know, how I interacted with my wife and with my kids. And it was just, it was tough to let it go Mm -hmm. because it wasn't so much that I failed. I can live with that. I fail every day, Mm -hmm. but that I failed someone else, someone who put their trust in me, right? right? And said, I'm in big trouble, help me. And I, and I didn't win. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then what happens is they're paying the consequence. And that's very difficult to live with. And it's not much different than being a commander in the military and something bad happens to one of your soldiers, you know, and and you're the one that that is ultimately responsible. I mean, if you think about it, uh, this is always tough because this is the question that I would ask myself when I would put leaders in charge is, you know, would I as a parent want to put my son or daughter in this person's care, right? And so when we would deploy, you know, this is someone's son or someone's daughter, mm-hmm. and it's they're my responsibility to take right. care of them, to bring them back safely. And if something happens to them, it's on me. That's tough. And it's tough in business and, you know, uh, when you have to terminate someone because maybe you've outgrown them and you as a leader failed to provide them with the training or the motivation. And maybe it's not true, but in your head, it's true. you're taking responsibility yeah, for you it. You took the L. Yeah. And so you, you lost. Uh, now I try to be a little bit more like Michael Jordan. Put the towel over your head for about 10 minutes, soak in the loss, learn your lesson, and get back out there. Yeah. But I will tell you the losses generally only make me hungrier. Uh, I love competition. Um, and if, you know, you can't, the, the wins are not as sweet without the losses. Right. That's a great answer. Um, you know, what was kind of a, what was a book that changed your life? Wow. Um, I've read a lot. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, maybe 10 years old, around the time I started my paper, my dad gave me If by Rudyard Kipling. Okay. So uh, a poem, but not, but yeah, there was a little little book, in a little Mm -hmm. book. Yeah. Great, great book. Great poem. Um, And then, you know, my mom, I think probably when I was 12, gave me a copy of Think and Grow Rich. Oh, nice. So yeah, so Napoleon Hill. Amazing. there have been so many, so many great books that I read. I think the one that kind of turned me on to the military was a, a, a book called Such, Me- Such Men Are Dangerous. And it was about, okay. this is like Lawrence Block or somebody. This is like a, a kind of a fiction thing about some guy's former military who's in a situation where it's like, he's got nothing to lose. And, and you know, all these people are trying to mess with him and he, you know, and he, and he, 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 he succeeds. But uh, ultimately, you know, I like to read everything. Um, so I, it's hard to... Uh, nail it down to one book. I think Relentless is one of those great books you read and you say, okay, there's somebody that. else out there who's like me, who gets it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but there are also so many other great books. I was an English major in, in college and oh, okay. I, I love to read. Uh, and so I love to le- read for leisure. Uh, I listen to audio books. I mean, I read over 50 books a year. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm not listening to a book in a car or reading a book, I have one in my briefcase. I, I, wherever there's dead time, whether I'm waiting to visit a client in jail, whether I'm on the plane, I am always reading. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. What uh, you know, what motivates you now? So I think I, I think we understand what motivated you when you were in the military. You know, just constantly rising up in the ranks, right? Um, I'm guessing. And correct me if I'm wrong. If that's not the motivation, was there other motivation outside of that? You know, I was fortunate when I was in the military because I always knew I was going to be a lawyer. I was going to get out. Oh, so you always knew. Then yeah, that's a question I should ask uh, early earlier. on. So yeah, a lot of young. Uh, Army officers, especially infantry, which is the most competitive branch, mm-hmm. uh, 
they care about their officer evaluation reports and they right. want to, you know, they want to get the one block, the top block that, that less than 50% get. And the reality is I always cared more about what my subordinates thought because I knew I was going to go on to be, be a lawyer. Um, so I've never, that hasn't been a big deal for me, but I can remember thinking about this when I was in college. It was probably my senior at William & Mary thinking, you know, I really don't want to be a lawyer. I want to be an entrepreneur. Like this, you know, this is what I want. I want to start a business. Yeah. And my idea at the time was kind of an eat, fit, go model. Oh, know? really? No yeah. kidding. Which actually, there was a company called Seattle Sutton that came out like maybe, you know, 10 years after that, which actually failed, mm-hmm. I think. Or maybe it became eat, fit, go. But regardless, so I, I had all these plans, like the yeah. things that I, businesses I wanted to start and things I wanted to do. And then, it, you know, it all came together. So I actually got the opportunity. And so, um, so in terms of, I guess you're asking me, so what is... Get back. To, I'm sorry. Let me. Yeah, yeah, how you rephrase the question? Right, and and the question now is, you know, what motivates you? Yeah. So what motivates me now? It, when I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, I think you'll find that you reach a certain point where money doesn't matter, mm-hmm. material things don't matter. Um, it's not because I have a yacht and a large house. I just don't want those things. Mm-hmm. I've never wanted those things. Right. Um, you know, uh, what motivates me is knowing. Um, that every day I go all in. I'm not really concerned about my legacy. People like, well, what do you want your legacy to be? I don't care. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I want to work hard and provide for my kids. I want them to have the opportunity to go to college, to go to graduate school if they want, to have the life that they want. I don't want them to suffer because of me. Right. Um, but on the other hand, I don't feel like I need to live in a palace. I don't feel like I need to uh, have a private jet. So the money really is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Um, What drives me is is winning. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, uh, it's the thrill of it. I had one lawyer uh, who does a lot of uh, jury consulting for us. Uh, We were talking and he's he's independently wealthy. And uh, and we were talking and he, he doesn't have to work. We were talking about our, you know, I was talking about the firm and what we do, and he said, "Wow, you know, you got twenty-five lawyers." I said, "Yeah." He said, "So you really don't have to work, do you? I mean, you could just you could just run the firm. You don't have to try all these cases." I said, "Yeah, that's true." He's like, "Why do you do it?" And I just kind of looked at him, and this guy's brilliant. And I said, "What do you mean? Why do I do it?" And he's like, "Well, why do you do it?" Why don't you just stay? Why are you trying these cases? Why are you putting in, you know, 12, 14 hour days uh, working on these cases? And I, I didn't know what to say. And he said, You do it for sport. And I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I think it, there's something to be said for it. It's something I believe in. I mean, as a military officer, I raised my hand to support and defend the Constitution. Now I do it defending my clients. I do it, uh, you know, for veterans, helping them get the disability benefits they've earned. And I think. In life, you, you know, purpose becomes extremely important. So, you know, what motivates me? My team, my mission, um, and I think knowing that I have a sense of purpose. And so, just understand that uh, there are people that. How can I? I had a, I, I met this lawyer, and he was going after something. I mean, it was crazy. I know his firm was, was making over $50 million a year. Mm-hmm. And we were at, we were out uh, in uh, Atlanta. We were having a good time with some other people. And he had to take this call from like a potential new client. And I said, what's that case worth? And he told me, I said, why are you taking the call? You know, you're the, you're the owner. And he's like, hey, you know, you don't make money by not being inconvenienced. <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> I understand, but you don't need the money. And he's like, yeah, I do. He says, I don't need, the, financially, I don't need the money. But, I need the- but he said, I need, I need that sense of purpose. He's like, and, and if I'm not hungry, nobody else is going to be hungry. So he says, yeah, I need the case. I need the case. I'm hungry. Uh, I wake up every day broke. <laughs> and he, he said, uh, you know, this, yep. is, this is who I am. It's what I do. And, uh, and yeah, I'm going to answer. I'm going to take that call. And, yeah, I could hand this over to another attorney in my firm. I don't need the case. I could not answer the phone. You're right. It wouldn't make me poor tomorrow, but it wouldn't be who I am. Don't want to compromise. No compromises. Uh, you know, you can't you, you can't change who you are at the core of your soul. Mm-hmm. You know, he says, hey, in my core, I'm a hustler. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this He's is, like, this gotta is how I got it. to where I am. <laughs> it's all I know, and I'm happy doing it. And if I stop doing it, 
then what good am I? Exactly. So what uh, what advice would you give to somebody that's looking to find their purpose? And uh, more specifically, uh, what advice would you give to somebody that's uh, you know pursuing a career as an attorney? So I think if you want to find your purpose, this is this is very difficult, right? Because you don't know until you're there. Yeah. Um, and the key is find out what challenges you, what scares you. Go do that. And then maybe you'll find your purpose. Um, as far as for an attorney, all right, your best mentors are going to be people who are actually practicing law. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I went to law school, I learned a ton. I clerked at the public defender's office in uh, Douglas County, learned a ton working there, and I learned a ton from the adjunct professors, the people who are actually practicing law right. and then would come back and, uh, and, and, and would teach in the evenings because they would give us practical advice. And I remember some of the uh, best advice I got, one attorney said, look, you're going to graduate. You guys are all senior or third, three L's. You're not going to be comfortable for at least five years. And I said, so just understand that. And so I think I got a lot of practical advice, a lot of great coaching. There were judges, there were uh, you know, practicing attorneys who came in who really told us what it was going to be like, something we did not get from the professors. It's something you don't get from academia. Right. Uh, and, uh, and just, so, hey, get malpractice insurance. That, you know, that was what I got from one of our, our criminal procedure uh, uh, professors. And, and it was, he said, you'll, you may never need it, but you'll sleep better at night. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just the practical advice, but also working with people who really, who really cared about, about that. And I have a couple friends here in Lincoln who are general counsel for large uh, corporations, mm -hmm. and they still teach because they want to stay connected to the legal community. They want to give something back. Of course. Um, so if you are you want to be a lawyer, those are the people to seek out. Seek out a mentor. Uh, and here's the other thing. Don't be stupid about opportunities. Um, I recently, um, for our Omaha office, uh, I, we were looking for um, an office manager. Right? And, and some of the applicants were uh, attorneys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they wanted, they wanted certain things. And I thought, I don't think you understand. If I would have had your opportunity 20 years ago to work with a rapidly growing law firm, I would be so far ahead of where I am today. And, and, you know, and some of them, you know, and, you know the, the conversations would, would go off into other things. And I, I couldn't, and when I couldn't bring them back to that, that's you when knew. I knew. You knew. This yep. is not the right person. Because if they can't get on board with the idea that they're on a winning team and that this is a huge opportunity to be a part of this expansion, then you don't want them anyway. Yeah. I mean, if I could go back today and pay someone a million dollars so that I could follow myself around to learn all those lessons, mm -hmm. I would do it in a heartbeat yeah. because that's where the education happens. It's in the experience. It's in taking the beatings. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I was not very, I didn't understand that when I first started working for my dad. You yeah. know, I thought I knew a lot. I thought I knew everything. Uh, like I said, it took me until about 40 to realize that feedback is a, is a gift. But I would, yeah, I think the greatest investment I could make if I could go back in time and, you know, work for myself. If I could and, and say, okay, this is what it's like. Uh, because I, when I came into this, I had, I had no idea. And right. a lot of it was, from the business perspective, trial and error. Yeah. You know, they, well, I, my, my father's a phenomenal lawyer, but in terms of um, the practice management, growing a practice, so much has changed in the past 20 years. I mean, back then, marketing was, uh, you put an ad in the yellow pages. Yeah. That's it. Throw, throw a radio spot out. Yep. Maybe yeah. Even TV. yeah. Maybe even TV. even back then, uh, back in the '80s, you know, uh, I mean, it was uh, Herb Friedman here in Lincoln mm -hmm. who was brave enough to do television commercials in the yeah. in the early '80s when no one else would. And yeah, so I mean, I I didn't have that. Uh, I really wish I would have uh, had that opportunity. And now when I talk to people and we talk about the opportunities and 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 it seems like people are more interested in other things. I think okay. You clearly, this okay. isn't this isn't what you want, and right. I think that's tough because some people just want a job, right? And it's very easy to get on the internet now and read about your team, and someone says, "Oh, well, Grindstone looks really cool, and yeah. you guys are doing great things, and I love your history, and I love how you know you come back and the story about rural Nebraska and what you've done <laughs> for everybody, and, and how you 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 went from doing that the sales into really building a, a, a marketing company. Wow, you're my guy, Landon. I I want to work for you, and then you say, okay, well. Look, like here's what we have to do. Let's let's break this down. And here's how I'm going to evaluate you, and 
Yeah, here's what the work looks like. Here's what the workday looks like. Hey, may, may, maybe 10, 12 hour workdays sometimes because we got to grind. I mean, this is, we're grindstone. Right, right? yeah. <laughs> we got to do the, the work. Name, man. <laughs> and they say, and they get scared. And like, well, you know, I don't know about this. And I don't know if I really want to be salaried if I'm working for $40, $45,000 a year and you're, you know, and you're going to work me this hard. No, I don't yeah, think I want that. Right. right. But the right person is going to say, you know what? I want to work for you. And, and in fact, you know what? I don't even want a salary. I want to figure out how you can pay me based on my performance. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, they start getting creative. Yeah, they start getting creative. And they say, look, you know, here's how we're going to do this. And I love, you know. Uh, You're looking for those people. Oh, I love those people. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, you know, my fiance's law firm, it's a kind of eat what you kill type of thing. They, oh, okay. they, 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 you know, if she doesn't work that month, she doesn't get paid. And, uh, and you know what? And she's great at it. And, yeah. and, 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 and for certain people, hey, that's the way. And, 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 I, and I love working with those people because there's no sense of entitlement. No. None. I, yeah. I got to go out and get it. Just like the next guy that the, and girl next to me. Like, they got to go get it too. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing free. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you don't, if you don't win, you don't get paid. And we live, I think where people get this wrong is, we live in a results economy. We don't live in a time and effort economy. Nobody cares how hard you try. Nobody cares how many hours you worked. If you fail as an entrepreneur, you fail. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to bail you out, figure it out, fail, get back up, get back out there, warrior ethos, get back on your feet. Don't even take time to dust yourself off. Just you get, get knocked down, get up, start swinging, you'll figure it out. Yeah, that's your, that's your advice to entrepreneurs. I was about to ask a follow-up of like, what's your advice to entrepreneurs? Like, that's clearly it. Hey, don't take, you know. What else it's, do you it's, have, it's important. Hey, well, I mean, it's important to learn your lesson, right? right? Pain is a teaching tool, right? Suffering is good. Mm -hmm. When you lose, it should hurt, right? But don't spend, don't dwell there. Mm -hmm. If you spend too much time, okay, I screwed up. Here's my lesson. Where do we go from here? If you spend too much time there, it's not going to help you. Uh, venting doesn't help anyone. Another great book is uh, a book by a Nebraskan, Cy Wakeman, No Ego. Uh, if you want to learn how to build a great culture, read No Ego. Got it. And then uh, there's also a book called Who. The uh, uh, it's a hi it's a hiring book. Uh, I can't remember who, but the, the, the title is Who. Uh, and then of course there's a book by Kim Scott, uh, Radical Candor. Radical uh, Candor, yeah, I've heard of that. But yeah. I think probably of those, probably the you know when it comes to hiring, retaining, understanding the best, who's the best, uh, no ego. Right. Read, read, read that book and understand that when you, I had a sergeant major that used to tell me, this tiny heart syndrome is contagious, right? And so tiny don't hearts. have an open door policy. Don't let come, people come in and, 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 and decompress because the reality is it doesn't help them, mm -hmm. right? That's, it, it, it's just contagious. So Whining people, is contagious. Right, yeah, Complaining is contagious. contagious. So people get that, your ass kicked and get back up and go back out there if you complain about it, your team's going to see you do that and they're going to think that's okay. Then they're going to complain. Right. Yeah. And, and to, I mean, we're in a different field than you. You have to think about that though. So we've got, we're in, and I, in terms of like aggressive people, right? You've got lawyers sure. over here. And then I would say you have creative people on the other end of the spectrum. So when you look at that and you look at people like venting is one thing, right? But like, be, you know, making sure that they feel like they're being heard. How do you, how do you make sure that you've, they still feel like they're being heard, but yet they don't have an opportunity to quote vent, like you said. That's where, as the coach, as a leader, that's where you step in and you coach them. Mm -hmm. And they start, you know, if they start going off, they're saying, okay, all right, so you've got a problem. Well, what does good look like right now? What would great look like right now? Mm -hmm. I understand how you feel. I understand that this problem exists. I'm not here to argue with reality and neither right. are you. We can't argue with reality. But what would great look like right now? What does solving this problem look like right now? Let's focus on that. Um, and you know, let's not worry about who screwed up what and how much money it costs us. We'll have the CFO yeah. <laughs> straighten us out. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll get to the bottom of that. But let's fix the immediate problem and let's focus our energy on solving the problem. Let's focus on the next step. And where do we go? We go to the end. 
like we talked about, this, and let's do our backwards planning. What does what would great look like to solve this crisis or this Got problem? It. And let's let's walk back as to what steps need to happen to get us there. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, we can complain about Joe being incompetent all we want. If Joe's incompetent, it's my fault. So we've got two options: Are we going to fire him or are we going to train him? They'll fire him. Joe sucks. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> who's going to replace Who's going to replace Joe? Right. Because if I fire Joe, either you or me are doing it. Yep. Either you or me are doing his job. So what's it going to be? Well, maybe we can keep – no, we don't want an incompetent person here. So yeah. we either have to train him or we have to fire somebody else. And then you have to have that discussion. Well, is the guy trainable? Mm-hmm. And is he a cultural fit? Right. And are these mistakes of skill or are they mistakes of will? And And go through that analysis and then say, okay, well – these are mistakes of skill, not will. So that's our fault. Either we hired the wrong guy who just can't do this, or we failed to train him. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's a mistake of will and Joe's a bad dude, and, or then, you know he's just not a cultural fit, well then, okay, what steps are we going to take to hire somebody else? Do we have to get on uh, LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter and, <laughs> and, and, and start the start our interview? Fun- because it all it's a funnel. The hiring is a numbers game, right? It's just like sales is a numbers game. Same thing uh, with hiring, right? You hear all the the people who give all these sales seminars. Well, it's just you know they talk about well, it's just a lifestyle thing. You get up and I know I got to make ten phone calls a day, and if I make ten phone calls, one person's going to buy the product, and right. and if I just do that every day, those numbers, it's going to work. Uh, hiring's no different. You right. may have to interview ten people to find that one person who's qualified and if you do that all week maybe you'll have five qualified people and maybe you'll find one of them that'll accept the job on your terms <laughs> right, <laughs> right? And, and, and so you have to have a funnel you have to understand that at the top of the funnel there's a bunch of people and you have to narrow that down so you're not spending all day interviewing the hundreds of candidates who could potentially uh, work at your organization and so you have to create your hiring process in a way and so when we talk about so now we're, we're talking about the hiring process we're talking about fixing the problem now Instead of complaining, right, we're problem solving. Yeah. Our just... energy and our time. And understand this as an entrepreneur, your time is gold. It is your most important asset. You will never be able to buy more time. Um, so you really have to think, you know, if when you hire someone, the key is hire the champions to begin with. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you take a risk. And there are people who are probably champions in some area, but ultimately are not a cultural fit. Or they're champions, but they're crazy. Right. <laughs> you know, <and> ultimately, yeah, <laughs> good cleave it there. It, it, just, it just isn't going to work out. Joe, um, Joey Hosman said the same thing when he talked about building a culture. So, from the time that you know he went and um, obviously his wife, I think you may know this, but his wife's diagnosed with cancer at like 35, right? So he goes from you know growing his company from nothing, literally like a blank resume, to doing 50 to 100 million dollar jobs, now 150 million dollar jobs, and he got to the point to where you know Bex uh, was diagnosed with cancer and found out how bad it was. And he was so focused on just like taking care of her. But all during that time, their firm not only grew, but it became more profitable. Now, I asked him like, how the hell did you do that? He's just like, we hired studs. He's like, just bottom line, like champions recruit champions. And we hired studs and they just, they, you put them in a circle and they're gonna make the circle bigger and better. And I, I like that advice to me was so crucial because you see like, he's, he's not there. He's not even mentally there. Even when he's physically in the building, he wasn't there. You know, like he had 50 million other things going through his head and business wasn't one of them. But yet the company was still growing and becoming more profitable. So I use that as a as a framework all the time to think about. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I know a lot of business owners who, the business is always most successful and profitable in the months that the business owner is out of the business. And, uh, you know, I have- <laughs> so that's, uh, not, that's not a normal thing. It's a very normal thing. Got it. Uh, and I think that that's, a, like I said, I learned this in the army that you want to find out how good as a commander how good your organization is leave leave see how they operate without you because that's going to tell you everything you need to know about your leadership you did you provide clear guidance does your team believe in the mission or do you have to be there every day pounding it into your head into their heads and so yeah no i've i've I, stories like that are, are actually pretty common but it didn't happen because Joey decided to step away. It happened because he was a good leader. Right. It happened because he had a good vision and a team that believed in him. And yes, you have to hire the studs and you you must hire champions and you must weed out those who are not champions and you must not compromise standards. But a lot of times we hear the story where the, the entrepreneur is, is faced with a challenge and that challenge is a, is, is a blessing because all of a sudden they have to compress their time, right? It's a, 
Parkinson's law, right? Yes. If you have five hours to study for a test, it's gonna take you five hours. If you've got one hour to study for a test, it's gonna take wow. you one hour, but you're gonna get your studying done either way. And uh, I think that those challenges uh, are sometimes some of the best, uh, provide the best opportunities that we get because they force us out of our comfort zone. They force us to do things we wouldn't uh, otherwise do because they don't make sense to us because we think in such a linear way. Like, I have to put in these hours. I have to be there. And it's not true. Not true. And probably my presence has probably slowed the growth of the company. Mm. I mean, I... I live in Omaha. I don't spend a lot of time in the Lincoln oh, office. Got it. Um, I still spend a lot of time with clients and, and other matters. I still I spend a ton of time working. I just don't spend it all in the office. I don't really like offices, um, for one. But the other thing is, um, I know that if I'm around all the time and I go in the office, guess what? Someone's going to hunt me down and try to find an answer. Um, and what do you mean by that? Well, understand that when you're present and someone has a problem. Uh, they the quickest the quickest way to do it is to oh, John's ask, here. Ask John. Ask button. John. Ask John. He knows, he, he knows. He knows. But if I'm not there, who are they going to ask? Themselves. The ask themselves. And how many times? And this is you know as as a lawyer training young lawyers, they ask a question about something. Look at the statute. Look at the case law. It's there. And you know we have training manuals. We have great procedures, processes, technology. And uh, you know, and someone has a question, and, and a lot of times it's right at their fingertips. So especially now, right? But here's the other thing: is I want people to go to my, I want my subordinate leaders to make decisions. I don't want anybody to do the end around, you know, and try yeah. to come into my right. office and talk to me. <laughs> and so I, I think as you as you scale, you really do have to limit limit your access. Not so much to protect your time, although that's important, but to protect those subordinate leaders to make sure that they know that they're making the decisions right. and that you aren't going to undercut them. And so when you know if they're not in the leadership team or it's not my assistant or it's not someone I'm working on a dr project directly with, I, I'm not comfortable talking to them alone, because. I, you know, all this open door nonsense, no. I want my leaders to take charge. I want my leaders to know that they are responsible for that person. I want my leaders to know that I will support their decisions, right or wrong, uh, good or bad. Yep. Uh, as long as they're, you know, as long as they're making mistakes of skill and not will, and they're doing everything uh, in the manner which, uh, in accordance with our core values. Right. Hey, I'm good with it, and I support them. Mm -hmm. And the only way they're going to learn is if sometimes we allow them to fail. And if I'm always there, if I'm always looking over people's shoulder, if I'm always critiquing, then uh, then that's then, then I'm not doing them any good. I, some of the best advice I got was from a man who said uh, he owned, he owned a, a large a large it was a hundred million dollar business, and he and I asked him. I said, so how do I know who to hire next on my leadership team? He said, where are you spending your most time? Oh, you're spending your most time in marketing? Hire a CMO. You're spending your most time in doing with HR matters? You need to hire uh, that HR person to come in and take care of that. Right. Um, and it's interesting. I, I sit in Omaha. I sit on a Vistage board, uh, which is a CEO group, and you know, and 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 you have these confidential conversations, you know. And sometimes you hear things that are like so obvious, you me, know. Me too, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you hear? Yeah. So I, I have one on Friday morning. Okay, and, and they so, yeah. one in Lincoln. Uh, it's here in Lincoln. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. So I and I just started going to that like three months ago. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a great program because you hear from people and someone saying, "Well, gee, I'm doing all this." Uh, you know, this is. The, I'll just give you an example because this is like uh, uh, kind of where where you see the light when someone else says it. But if you, yes. if, if it's your problem, you don't get it. But let's just say that you know, man, grindstone is is uh, <laughs> is killing me. I'm spending you know twenty hours a week on HR. And I said, well, Landon, you know, what if if you use those twenty hours a week to go out and sell? Let's say you weren't a sucky salesperson. Let's say you're a really good salesperson. Yeah. <laughs> Landon, what if you were out there selling? What, what's your average project that you sell? Oh, you know, I sell a hundred thousand dollar project. Mm -hmm. Oh, how many hours do you have to put in? Oh man, it probably takes me five. Okay, what's your success rate? I I close all the time. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So basically, <laughs> what you're telling me is, if you had those twenty hours back, you could bring in another hundred thousand, four or five hundred thousand dollars of the business. Mm -hmm. How much is an HR person going to cost you? 60, 70. All right, so right, the, the damn, math is pretty damn good one. <laughs> the math yeah. is pretty easy, right. right? You go hire that HR person, you do what you do best, which whether yeah. it's selling, marketing, training, um, and so, and it, it's but but see when we're in that position, it's so it hard to see. Uh, in the military we had the 360 feedback where you're, you you know your your uh, superiors would write uh, reviews. This was all 
non-attribution, so it was never used against you in your evaluation Got reports, uh, and you didn't know who it was. <laughs> and then your peers, and then your subordinate leaders, and they would all give feedback. And so you could hear things about yourself, but it's always when you're, you know, what do they say? You can't see when you're inside the ketchup bottle or whatever. You can't, you know, you can't see the outside. You don't understand. And, right. And sometimes when you're when you're stuck in the in the in the business, you can't see that. And so a lot of, you know. The great titans will say, you know, you have to work outside of the business. You yes. can never work in the business. But I don't think that's true because unless you're in the business, you can't really figure out what's broken. So you have to learn to be in the business at times and then work on the business with an outside perspective. But you're at, you know, you, uh, I, I think that happens to us all the time where we're like, I got to solve this problem. I got to solve this problem. And it comes back to, well, wait a minute. Okay. How long is it taking you? How long does it take? <laughs> and then it comes back to the Dan Sullivan question. Who, not how. Are we going to solve this problem? Yep. Who do I really need to come in here and do this? Because this is costing me a lot more time and money and aggravation and motivation than I expected. And uh, that's 100% what I was, what I had ran into is like I, early stages. So like there's six, pers- we're a six person team. So obviously running into a lot of that now, starting to delegate things. Our production team, I used to head up production passing off that to uh, our other leaders in the company that are taking on the production roles. So delegation is something where I literally went to the group. So I did what you exactly just described. Went to the group, said, I'm having this problem. Like, I don't know what to do with this. And like, how much does that person cost? Like this, hire them. (laughs) And and like, sometimes you just need to hear that from somebody else to actually make it happen. So uh, one of the last questions we always ask at the end of the show is, uh, you know, when, when you're gone, and, and I know your legacy you said wasn't the biggest thing in the world to you, but when you're gone, what do you want people to remember about you, John? I don't care what they remember about me, but I care about what they remember about the firm, about the team. You know, I want them to remember Barry Law helping them. I want veterans to remember you know, the, that, that we had their backs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and obviously those that we represented in court that we did battle alongside in the courtroom. Um, you know, I want them to remember that, that we gave a part of ourselves, you know, and I think sometimes, uh, you know, there's, <sighs> when people hire us, it's important that whether you're the entrepreneur or the lawyer, you're the buyer, right? That ultimately someone comes to me and says, "Well, will you, you know, represent me?" And I said, "Well, this is what, how much it costs." And the question becomes, "Well, you know, and am I expensive? Yeah, but I'm expensive because you're worth it. Right. And if I'm going to take your case, I mean, I'm going to put everything I have into it, and I only have so much time. Right. So for me, that is important. I think that to be remembered by the clients, and most importantly, the team, to say that, hey, when I was at Barry Law. I got this great opportunity. And not everybody's gonna be on the train forever. There are people that are gonna be with us for years. There are gonna be people that are gonna be with us for decades. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some people I hired where uh, I can think we have this phenomenal woman who worked for the VA for over 30 years and she was retiring and I, I loved her because when we would make an argument at the VA, she'd say, you know what, that argument is not gonna work. But here's what will. And this woman was not a lawyer at the time, but she knew the law. Yeah, and she said, you know, this is how. They, she, but she was there to help the veterans, mm-hmm. and uh, and then when she retired, she said, well, you know, I want to travel a lot, and I said, well, you know, would you be willing to work for us on a part time basis? And now she's working. She's you know probably working 60, 70 hour weeks right now, <laughs> part time. And this is you know t- <laughs> ten years later, right? Yeah. And this is this is someone who, uh, you know, it, people like that. You know, I mean, it just it just blows my mind that someone can be so dedicated and so. My hope is that I celebrated them enough so that uh, they feel appreciated, but also other team members understood that. And even though this person, I want to keep this person on the train for the yeah. whole ride, you know, the people that only were with us a short time, I hope that they see that. I hope they get something out of that. I mean, I want someone to come out of my firm and be my biggest competitor, right? Because I love a competition. Yep. And I look forward to beating them. Yep. But if they surpass me, I'm going to be very proud of that. Mm-hmm. As a leader, you want to develop uh, winners, winners who, who are better than you. That's, yeah, that's exactly, it's funny because Joey, Joey said the same thing and we actually cut the clip from Hausman. It was like, look, you know, like there's plenty of people that are gonna come into our firm, learn what we do. Like, oh man, I could do that better. And he's like, you know, I could, I could sit there and I could try and say, oh, well, I don't think you should do that or I don't think you should do that, but who am I to tell you you're not supposed to go chase your dreams? Yep. And I think that you definitely have said that in the last, in the last few minutes here. So thank you uh, for your time today, John. I mean, you're, this has been 
there's so much action packed content inside of this. So I appreciate your time and My I appreciate pleasure. you sharing all this information with us. Uh, as usual, you guys can check us out at spark to fire podcast on all social media. And thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're listening on iTunes and Spotify and as usual, keep striking. <laughs>